Welcome to another Second Act show. Uh, great to see all of you out there. Thank you for tuning in with us. I'm John Tarnoff. And I'm Carrie Hannon. And today I've decided that we are the Rosemary Clooney and Jose Ferrer of <laughs> the Second Act careers. Don't ask me to sing. <laughs> Don't ask me to act. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, we are uh, we are uh, really excited and uh, humbled to have uh, uh, Paul Irving on our broadcast uh, today, uh, a, uh, a friend of the program of the two of us and a fellow uh, Next Avenue influencer on aging. So we have three influencers uh, on the show today. I don't know if we're all going to eat one another alive, but we're, uh, we're all good. So just a little bit of background. I'm sure most, if not all of you uh, know Paul. Uh, but I'll just kind of give the, uh, the background. Uh, he is a corporate nonprofit director and advisor to leaders in business, philanthropy, and academia, uh, author editor of the groundbreaking Upside of Aging, uh, which is uh, kind of the, 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 the or, uh, uh, tome that we all, I think, uh, got into this, uh, this uh, fabulous book. Yeah. Right. This, this business uh, on. Um, and uh, he is uh, also, of course, the, um, uh, the founding uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm kind of trying to, the you know the founding director of the uh, Milken uh, Center uh, founding chair of the Center for the Future of Aging uh, now a fellow at Milken uh, serves on many boards focuses to a large degree on health and longevity uh, and uh, uh, you know accolades too numerous to mention uh, and I have a particular interest in talking to him about his transition into this space. Um, so without further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Paul Irving. Hey, <laughs> hey. John and Carrie, what, what a pleasure to be with you. And by the way, John, if you're Jose Ferrer and, and, and Carrie's Rosemary Clooney, I promise you I'm not George Clooney. Although, by the way, I, we, we can always hope. Anyway, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Pleasure well, to thank see you. You, you. Thank you for joining us. It's so fun to yeah, have you here. Sure. And, you know, we both are, you know, so inspired by your work. So thank you, Paul, for your time. Well, thanks for all, all that both of you do as, as well. You know, let, Carrie, let's I, start I, let, let, let's I, start I, off. I just I have to say, I keep seeing Carrie's, Carrie's book all, all over the place. And I think I've, I've never yeah. been so famous as, <laughs> as I have been for my endorsement blurb on, on the top of her right on the her, cover her, yeah her, i mean Terry Hannon has done more to promote my career than anybody else <laughs> so, not I true but it's still an honor to have your name there yeah. <laughs> so so paul before we kind of get into i want to get into your background uh and i we've got a bunch of issues obviously we want to talk about but uh, carrie and i were talking about this with you before the show what's keeping you up at night what are the top of mind issues now, as we get into 2023, that um, uh, that are grabbing your attention and that you want to share with us and our listeners. So, what's keeping me up at night is sciatica. No, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm teasing. I, I'm I'm doing fine. Um, you know what? You know what's what's interesting. It's not it's certainly not keeping me up at night, but it's it's um, kind of a, a continuing paradox for, for, for me. And that is, and I think, you know, we should talk both about this as a, as a system level challenge and opportunity and a personal challenge and op opportunity, but kind of thinking about it at a system level, we've seen stories just in the last couple of weeks about the reversal in, in population in, Ch in China seen as a potential crisis for, for, for China. Uh, just in the in the past several days, the PM in uh, Japan has has made statements about the, their own age shift as being a threat to the future of of, of the country. It's it's ec economic uh, system, it's social system, the supports that it has to provide for older adults and, and all the rest. And I've been saying for a long time that may, maybe the, the the wisest person uh, who who uh, Maybe didn't think he was writing about age, aging, but really should have been. Was was Robert Frost when he wrote about two rows diverged in, in a yellow wood? Um, you know, the answer is we we have been going down a road for a long, long time. Systems based on the younger population, a misunderstanding of the value and potential of older adults, 
uh, a failure to capitalize on the potential of the longevity economy, uh, uh, underinvestment in prevention and wellness, the kind of thing that can extend uh, both health span and potentially, potentially lifespan, uh, and, and certainly uh, the opportunity to democratize health uh, lifelong learning that I know both of you are really are really interested in. So, so you know, I'm always kind of uh, amazed by, and maybe it's a reflection of, frankly, of the failure of a lot of us who work in this in this area to really communicate the importance, the urgency, and the potential of of population aging, um, and we need to do more soon. V very much like climate change, right? I mean, uh, it's one of those things that we've had. I think difficulty drawing attention to, but what we know uh, is something that will literally change everything, everything about our society, from housing and urban planning to the way our companies uh, work and, and what they make, to the way our education system works and, and, and who it serves. And so, um, you know, if you want to know what keeps me up at night, I suppose, right. I suppose it's all of that. So I guess my follow-up to that would be, what do you think will be, when you think about climate change, we talk a lot about the impact of inaction uh, and, uh, and, and the, you know, the 2%, uh, the two degree uh, uh, sea level uh, yeah. temperature rise. Is there a similar impact um, that you see due to inaction in the, uh, in the aging space? Absolutely. I mean, look, I'm regularly asked the, the question, and I know that you, uh, you two are as, as well. Talk about the silver tsunami. And of course, I hate talking about the silver tsunami. I hate, I hate the, the reference. I talk about it as golden opportunity. Um, but, but there is a reality, and the reality is populations will look, communities and regions and countries will simply look much older in, in the decades to come. And by the way, not just the United States and the EU and, and much of, of, of Asia uh, in the future as a result of the advancement of women and the availability of, of, um, of birth control and the reduction in infant mortality rates and a whole series of, of other things, you're going to see the same trends exist in India and Sub-Saharan Africa. So the bottom line is populations are simply going to look older in, in, the, in the decades to, to come. And uh, if we don't adapt our systems, our cultures, our, our expectations, we are going to end up with populations that are sick and dependent, uh, unable, unable or unwilling to work um, in, in circumstances that are really unsatisfactory and not attuned to their needs. Uh, we will have uh, gaps in skill and training because we haven't invested in the, in the, in the, potential again of, of older of older people we will have generational divides and the potential generational warfare when young people are called on to uh, sacrifice their own their own futures for the benefit of, old, of older adults and and by the way I I see these things but none of them are necessary none of them are necessary with with uh, with intelligent policy and practice change you know, I very much believe in, in the potential of longevity economy, the wonders of intergenerational engagement. Both of you know I'm on the co-generate board. This was uh, Encore.org for, for years, and I served as, as chair of that organization for a number of years. So I, I deeply believe in the potential and possibility and, and fabulous successes of intergenerational connection. Uh, uh, I, I understand the, 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 the possibilities, the potential of of, of lifelong training and reskilling, the reinvention of our academic institutions, but we just can't seem to to get our leaders to think. Uh, I'll, I'll say I'll say it this way: they spend so much time looking in the rearview mirror rather than looking out the windshield at, at what's coming. And again, I think climate change and population aging are maybe the two most important issues they have to deal with, and their failure to do that is just inexcusable. And Paul, what do you think corporate America should be doing or business leaders in terms of the workplace? I mean, are there some yes. things that they could grapple with, like really get their teeth into today that can make a difference? Well, Carrie, you know, I, I, I have a recent, um, with co-authors, recent Harvard Business Review a piece on this that, that I commend to people. I think it's behind the paywall, but but um, if anybody can get HBR, I think it might be of interest, which really talks about how 
employers should be thinking about older and essential workers, really in many ways, the most important workers we know. And if there's anything we learned during COVID, it was uh, for those of us who are lucky enough to do what the three of us are doing right, right now, right? Zooming and working from our homes and the comfort of our, of our, uh, of our home offices and, and all the rest, we were dependent on the people who delivered our food and took care of our parents and uh, who, who cleaned our streets and who drove the trucks to get our goods to, to where they, they needed, to, needed to go and those people need and deserve, deserve respect. So anyway, I'd, I'd commend a, a look at that piece if people are interested. But look, I mean, to me, again, this is one of those things where the answers are, are pretty obvious. Uh, you know, during during this recent bout of inflation, we've had lots of conversation about work, workforce shortages, uh, extraordinarily low rates of unemployment, uh, employers grappling with how to how to recruit and retain people to to work in their factories and in their stores and in their in their in their you know kind of corporate corporate off offices, and the answer is with birth rates well below replacement rate in, in most of the developed world and frankly now expanding into 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 developing economies uh, with the uh, with the reality of, of, of population aging there are four or five things that every employer should be thinking about uh, one how to recruit and retain and and adapt to an older workforce two how to uh, engage uh, inter intergenerational workforces. In other words, to reap the benefits that we know exist of the, as a result of the complement of the skills of young people and, and old people, the creativity and energy and risk-taking uh, characteristics that the young people bring to the table and the wisdom and judgment experience, understanding how to navigate uh, complex environments, corporate politics that come with, 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 with age. Uh, we know that uh, that companies have to uh, invest in in technology and artificial intelligence to address workforce shortage. And I would say maybe most important, and certainly this is this is something that that um, I guess I really agonize over, over relating to the United States. There's been this crazy and frankly uninformed uh, narrative about about the value of immigration and the value of immigrants in the United States, and it is remarkable and remarkably mis misplaced. Uh, immigrants are not only uh, uh, people of extraordinary value; they they're job creators at levels uh, in excess of those levels of of people who were who were born here. Uh, and we desperately need need Im immigrants to address the the workforce challenges that are that are in front of in front of us. So, uh, a, a, an enlightened, advanced, forward thinking immigration policy and immigration practices is critical to the future of every country in the world. And in fact, I think we're very likely to be looking at an era ahead in which the smartest companies are competing for Im immigrant talent. Uh, not 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 shun, shunning it, not insulting it, not degrading it. Right. Well, I think it also relates to climate, and I think that the the climate migration uh, that uh, we've been seeing, uh, which is not unfortunately being uh, connected to climate, um, is just going to increase. So we need to figure out how to work with it, as opposed to try to build the walls to keep it out because a it's not going to work b we actually can benefit absolutely absolutely i mean you know, look I, there, there's been a lot of criticism i think understandable and some very proper criticism of, of globalization over the last number, number of years but the reality is it is one world it's one little little planet and um, and we have to think about how how we can serve people on a, on a global basis. We have to think about the connection of Americans to our, to our counterparts overseas. And we have to think about how our products and services and uh, needs will, will be addressed um, and who we need here to, to address them. And, and, and again, you know, I think, I think some of the stuff that's happened in our political environment on this front has been really unfortunate over the last uh, number of years. And 
let me just say, I, I, uh, I personally, I'm a Californian and I personally appreciate living in, in a majority minority state that is, is diverse and inclusive. Uh, and I think it's something that, that people all over the country should be thinking about. There are those who certainly dis disagree with me that uh, ultimately the, the uh, communities and regions and in our case, states and, con and countries that are able to attract and successfully integrate uh, immigrants will be those less affected by the impacts of, of uh, historically low birth rates. Yeah. Kara, can I just slip a, a follow-up follow uh, in on that? Because I want to circle back to your second point about intergenerational uh, uh, initiative policy cooperation. Um, I think that the pushback that I think a lot of, a lot of corporate leaders would, would put to you is, we don't know how to do this. We don't know how to create this intergenerational uh, framework that you're talking about. Uh, and is there an opportunity, do you think, to create on some level, whether it's through conferences, events, best practices, publication, thought leadership, uh, a, a roadmap or a, or a playbook uh, that, uh, that companies can use? Because this is very much terra incognita, I think, for a lot of people. Uh, it's something which, I mean, obviously ageism in hiring is rampant. So clearly we're operating on old paradigms. How do sure. we shift this? And it's got to come from the top, obviously, right? It's not going to come from the middle. Uh, managers aren't going to do this. They're too overwhelmed. They don't have time for this. It's going to have to come from senior leadership. How do we get that going? Yeah. Well, I mean, look, the answer is there's already good evidence for it. Um, as Laura Carstensen at the Stanford Longevity Center uh regularly writes, she and I have done, done some stuff together on, on, on this. There is an emerging body of evidence, evidence that suggests that intergenerational teams outperform same age teams of, of any age. There are successful programs and projects going on today in, in corporations. And the answer is uh, young people and old people routinely say that they care about the same things. They want flexibility in their, in their jobs. They want jobs that provide dignity and respect. They want compensation uh, for the job, not for tenure. They 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 want um, uh, they they appreciate inter intergenerational connection and, and work well together. So the the question is, can we figure out a way to desegregate an age segregated society, a society that in many ways embraced age segregation and living conditions, you know, kind of retirement communities on the one hand, and educational institutions that were designed only only for, for for young people if we if we start to change these things one by one I think very naturally what we will do is reap the rewards that come from the creativity of young minds and the wisdom and experience of, of, old, of old minds and it'll it'll serve every everyone beautifully and by the way it's not it's not just internal it's it's understanding the products and services that are needed both of you I know are, are longevity economy advocates what what people call silver economy in, in, in the UK and and EU and um, and that really is an understanding of the potential the the market uh, op opportunity that, that exists to serve a dramatically under underserved older population when I speak to young people on campus and I do fairly regularly uh, and I talk to them about you know exciting opportunities in engineering computer science bioscience and, and all the rest, and, and I talk about aging, these are not negative conversations. They're positive, excited conversations about the cool new tech that can be can be developed, whether it, whether it's apps or or devices, you know, digital health devices or 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 other things that can improve uh, older lives. So again, you know, you can look at this and, and wring your hands, or you can look at it and, and say, we've got some work ahead, but the work is, is exciting and, and holds a wonderful possibility for, for success and flourishing and growth. So, so um, Paul, I, lo I love your answers there, and I think it's so thoughtful and really a, a lot for, for us to forward, go forward thinking about. And I will say anecdotally, I took a full-time uh, in-house job at Yahoo Finance a year ago, and I, I, uh, I work for my manager is probably two decades younger than me. Yeah. And it is 
fabulous. Yeah. I have never felt so energized about my work again and so valued and respected as well as getting really excited about how smart she is and how, you know, and then the other team members are younger ones too. But I never thought at this stage of my life, I would be so excited about my work again. And I think it's because of that intergenerational energy. Uh, which yeah, is Carrie, I'm, I'm not, I'm not surprised. I mean, I think, I think there's this expectation for some reason. And again, it's been promoted by those who like to elevate the notion of intergenerational warfare and all, and all the rest. I, I just think that that's not not proven. I think what is proven is is the young people and old people actually enjoy work, working together. They yeah. they understand that they that they have complementary experiences and, and and skills. They understand that they can learn from from each other. Uh, yeah. And you know, the bottom line is employers need to spend more time speaking with their employees. You know. Uh, with with due respect to my friends in human resources, you know, it's wonderful to have employee manuals and it's wonderful to have catalogs and it's wonderful to have policies and procedures, but you know what? It's time to get out of the office and have conversations with yeah. the people who you're actually employing young and old. And I think, I think what, uh, what would oftentimes be found is that there are common interests, common, common objectives, uh, value placed on these inter intergenerational connections. And John, you're absolutely right. At the end of the day, the, the call needs to come from the C-suite. Yeah. You know, middle, middle, man middle managers are, are, bus are busy pressured. It's very hard for them to get out of their boxes. We need more CEOs stepping up, recognizing the reality of the demographic shift, recognizing the potential and talking about it. Yeah. And One 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 shout out that I would I would pivot to off of off of what you're just saying about uh, uh, HR uh, is that uh, uh, this notion of and practice of uh, ERGs employee resource groups which is which is taking hold now in many many companies and giving people uh, at the grassroots level an opportunity to organize and participate in issues that are important to them uh, and very much pivoting off of DEI initiatives. This is an opportunity, uh, HR people, to encourage these kinds of conversations uh, intergenerationally. So if, you, if you're looking for a way to start this at the grassroots level, start some ERGs that, that really appeal to the intergenerational um, uh, needs of your organization. Absolutely, and, and think, think about the evolution of, of roles, about how, how you can retain knowledge and customer relationships and and again, under, understanding about, about environments. I mean, one of the problems is, is things like compensation systems. The compensation systems tend to reward individual results, individual conduct, as opposed to team conduct. What if, let me just hypothesize, what if, what if you had to have a team principally composed of younger people, but you had a couple older people involved in the team whose job it was to mentor, to uh, help those younger, younger people succeed? By the way, the older people not being sidelined but not necessarily standing at the center e either. Letting young, letting young people people do do that work and making sure you help them. Aren't there ways to measure that kind of productivity, that kind of performance? The answer is yes, of course, uh, but not enough not enough uh, companies do it, do it. So, look, I I don't want to be too negative, but I do see points of light. I do I do uh, have a sense that there's increasing interest in, in this and more and more people in, in kind of the corporate world, if for no other reason than just necessity, again, understanding workforce shortage challenge, challenges are kind of taking it on and saying, gee, maybe we should think about reskilling and training older people making the same investments in our senior store force as we do in our junior force. You know, they're thinking about as as Carrie's experiencing these. Uh, the power of these intergenerational connections. So I'm optimistic that it'll happen. It's just that we have to push these things faster. So Paul, can we talk a minute about, you mentioned in, in some of your remarks earlier about how sort of the education system in this country needs to shift. A lot of it due to the population change as well, because there's not as many younger people. And I know you benefited at one point in your career of making that shift to your second act by spending some time on campus at Harvard. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about the importance of that opportunity in your career, uh, in your next stage in your career, and what you recommend today for other people for those kinds of opportunities. Sure. 
Well, let, let me let me start by the, on, on the macro. So, so, so the macro environment. Let's just talk about the U.S. Uh, but this is very much true across across the developed world. In the United States, about half of our universities and colleges are at risk of failure, li literally at risk of bankruptcy, because they are principally dependent on on tuition revenue as the, as their source. They have they have uh, relatively small endowments. This is not true of Ivy League universities. It's not true of the of the elites and some of the wealthier wealthier schools, but about half have this challenge, and part of it is that they designed their system, which made a sense, I suppose, in some way in generations past, when our demographic pyramid went like that instead of like that, and kind of moving moving to, moving to that, they were focused on people between you know 18, 18 and twenty three, and just. Uh, reach the conclusion that for the rest of our lives we sh we shouldn't be learning. So 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 Carrie, I I was fortunate, um, blessed to to be in the in the second cohort of a, of a fellowship program that Harvard University developed called the Advanced Leadership Initiative, typically audacious Harvard, their their name not mine, <laughs> and um, and it was wonderful. I got to spend uh, a year on the on the Harvard campus, a year a year in Cambridge with uh, with a terrific group of, of people who were kind of similarly situated, all of us having been in leadership positions, all of us, I think, having some level of angst about what we were going to do with the rest of our lives, how we could make some kind of meaningful contribution, and understanding the value and the beauty of education. And boy, it's, it's a, if you didn't like college the first time, trust me, you'll like it, you'll like it the second time. It was fantastic. And I do have to say, by, back to the intergenerational piece, you know, you'd think, and I'm probably going to get nasty letters as a result of saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. You know, you'd, you'd think that the smartest people at Harvard University were on faculty and the next smartest group of people would, would be the graduate students. I have to tell you, the most impressive people I ran into at Harvard were the undergrads. They were just amazing. I mean, really amazing. And uh, how much fun to hang out with some 19 year olds and talk about, you know, American politics or talk about, about the state of the world. It was, it was, it was great. Now, the good news is, is that that was the first of a series of programs that, as you, as you both know, have been spawned as a result of this. The second one, and I actually serve on the advisory board of it, is the Stanford Distinguished Careers Institute uh, program that, uh, that Phil Pizzo initially started at, at Stanford University. But there are now these programs at, at the University of Texas, Notre Dame, uh, University of Chicago has 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 a new program. Uh, Oxford in the in the UK and many others. And I think the challenge for all of us who believe in this notion of lifelong learning, not not just programs that kind of sit at the side of the university. By the way, as much as I I deeply admire the OSHER programs, for for example, that exist on a number of campuses, they tend to still be age segregated, right? I mean, there's still kind of a group of older people sitting in classrooms uh, with, with each other. The beauty of these other programs is, is that the older students or, or fellows are, are fully integrated in, in university life. And there's a special joy to that. And by the way, I think that the students um, have found great reward in being able to hang out with older people who aren't their parents. You know, they actually they actually listen to <laughs> who, who aren't who aren't their parents. So um, so I think the challenge for all of us is how do we democratize this? I mean, how, this is the kind of thing that shouldn't just exist at elite universities. It, it should exist in in state colleges. It exists in community colleges across America. It exists in high school continuation programs, and and, and the like. Uh, lifelong learning is not just a nice thing to do. It's necessary and it's uh, critical for not only for personal growth and joy and the sustainability of one's relevance in, in our society. It's critical for our economic future. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah. anyway. I, Brings it back around to the age bubble question, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, so, so I, you know, when, when I, I regularly get, you know, I kind of get, big questions about what's happening in, in, the, in the world of, of demography and all the rest. And I get very personal questions from, from people all the time about what should I do? And the first thing I say to people is, is go back to school. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think for all of us on a, on a personal level, and this has certainly been true for, for me too. 
Um, and both of you know this. I think a, a challenge for all of us as we age is the windowing of our relationship networks. You know, uh, families move away, friends die. Uh, the way we met people earlier in our, earlier in our lives, you know, in school, in college, uh, in relationships. You know, for those of us who who have who have kids. Um, spending time with our with our kids friends and becoming involved in our kids schools and obviously work work the workplace when those things start to go away our relationship networks start to start to narrow and and the beauty of of school the beauty of, of going back is it's an opportunity to re-energize those net those networks and develop new friends and i have to say by the way just as a shout out in case any of them are are, are watching um the the my pals in in that in that Harvard program and I, and I get on a Zoom call now once a month religiously with with, with each other, and uh, I have to tell you, you know, we range from probably now I don't know mid mid sixties up to uh, one of one of the members of our of our group is is just about to have his his eightieth birthday, and we're like a bunch of eighteen year olds hanging out with each other. <laughs> Having, having a, just having a great time. So anyway, I, I commend school. Good mm -hmm. Great. Carrie, you, you, you've got the last question. Oh my gosh. Well, I, I think that, you know, really, I think the most important thing, Paul, if you just would share with us kind of uh, your, your looking ahead, uh, what you'd like to see roll out in the next, uh, even a short time frame, the next year or two, what can, what's manageable that we might, we might expect. Well, Carrie, you write a lot about about uh, financial security, which is, I think, uh, really important. And I think, on an individual level, the, the two most important things we can we can do are uh, make public investments in prevention and and wellness. The thing we know that works, right? We spend about ninety percent of our U.S. health budget on treatment and care, another four or five percent on on research and cure. But the one thing we know is, is that if we can keep people healthier as a result of better nutrition, uh, continuing reductions in smoking rates, uh, improvements in, in safety, that, that we can improve live, lives at, at scale. So on a, on a macro level, I'd certainly like to see that on a micro level. I think for all of us, you know, exercise, you know, I got the Fitbit on. <laughs> I'll try to do my ten thousand, my ten, my ten thousand, my ten thousand today. I can, I can still do it. You know, I, I was, uh, I was a, a pretty decent athlete when I was, when I was a younger guy, and I'm a terrible athlete now. But the, but the bottom line is, I can still get on the exercise bike. I can right. still, can still walk. Just be an uh, athlete. Get a, dog, get a dog. They, they make you. Get walk. A dog, right? That's what I was right. gonna yeah. say. So, uh, so <laughs> that's on the, on the health side and on the, on the, on the financial security side. Obviously, Carrie, we've, we've had. Um, some recent developments that I know you've written about uh, in, in in policy that uh, make it somewhat easier for employers to provide um, re retirement systems for for their for their folks. But you know, look, the bottom line is, in my view, uh, our income inequality and wealth inequality in in, in America is just uh, inexcusable and. Mm -hmm ultimately can only lead to, to bad things. So I think we need to do more to provide uh, services and supports, I think, to expand Social Security and, and, and Medicare to particularly address the challenges of, of caregiving, both support for, uh, for family caregivers and for direct, for direct care workers, an experience that almost all of us will experience in some way in our lives. These are common denominators. Um, and I think we all need to be advocates for this. And, I, and, and look, I'd probably be making a mistake if I also didn't mention the word ageism. I mean, all, all of us need to, need to spend time calling it out, talking about it, and, and confronting it. Uh, yeah. The Civil Rights Act in 1964 didn't end racism, and the modern women's movement now 50 years ago or so didn't create pay parity. It takes a long time to affect change. You know, the the... The LGBTQ move, movement has changed things in that community very, very quickly and, and in many ways successfully, but there's still many, many challenge, many, many challenges. So, you know, I don't know whether in the lifetimes of the three of us, ageism 
negative age bias about older adults will be will be gone. But I sure hope I got a relatively new grandson, and I hope by the time he's my age that that people say to themselves, you know, not just that old people are are, are okay, but that that the possibility of what you might do when you when you get old is something that is an exciting notion throughout life. Yeah, something to look forward uh, to. So that's what I hope. That's a great way to end it. Um, Paul Irving, thank you so much for spending this time with us and sharing some of these great ideas and very great inspirational. Seeing great seeing you both. Yeah, great great, great, great seeing you both. I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait for Carrie Ann to sing. I'm not giving up on that notion. <laughs> so, anyway. I'll, I'll have to do it privately. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, Take everyone. Care. Thank Good you. Soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>